All right, let's, uh, we'll let our kids head toward children's worship, our kindergartners through fifth graders. If you want to make your way to kids' worship, and while they're making their way out, go ahead and pull out your Bibles with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 4. That's where we're going to be this morning. We're going to look at one verse, mainly, uh, this morning in the minutes that we have together. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, is where we're going to be. And Josh uh, mentioned that earlier uh, in the service when he revealed to us that he was a teenager at one time. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12 says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Let me read it one more time. It's on the screen as well. It says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Um, This is the fourth message in our series called We Are Family. And I thought today would be fitting for us to take a day as a church to focus on our student ministry, on our youth. And um, believe it or not... um, I was a youth at one time, uh, one point in time in life, in the history of things as well. Um, and you look at this scripture that Paul wrote to Timothy, and there's a, there's a bigger context here, really. You really look at verses 11 through 16 to get the whole context. Because as you read this, I think it would be easy to say, let no one despise you for your youth. It would be easy to say, well, you know, we don't need to look down on teenagers. We don't need to always be so critical of of young people. Um, But there's actually a responsibility there. Paul's telling Timothy, who, by the way, was not a teenager. Paul, uh, Timothy was 30 years old at this time. He was, yet he was young in that culture. He was young in that setting to be doing what he was doing. And so we have to understand that youth youth is relative anyway. Um, but he said, let no one despise you for your youth. But here's the responsi- responsibility in it. He said, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. I mean, so, so you look at Paul talking to Timothy. He's 30 years old. I mean, being young is really relative to your setting, isn't it? I mean, people... Uh, youth can set an example for older people just as well as older people can set an example for, for younger people, can't they? I mean, I'll be, let me be real honest with you. I've seen some older people who were terrible examples. They were horrible examples for younger people, and I've seen younger people be great examples for older people. I've seen younger, people's, younger people be examples for their parents when their parents were screwing it up. I, I've seen younger people in the church outserve older people in the church and put older people to shame who have a servant's heart and, and want to make a difference for the kingdom, and we're just lazy. I, I've, seen, I've seen it before. And, and so, really, here's, here's Paul, and he's giving Timothy this, this, this whole understanding that, that you're called to be a servant. He's speaking to a believer here. He's speaking to a, to a Christian. I mean, look at, let me, let me kind of read the whole context. Verse 11, if you've got your Bibles. We won't have the, all of this on the screen, but it... It, it, here's what Paul said to Timothy about being a servant of Christ. He said, command and teach these things. And then, he, then in verse 12, the verse we've read, he said, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. And he said, until I come, devote yourself. Here's what Paul told Timothy he needed to be doing. Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift that you have. I mean, listen, our young people are much more talented than most of us. They can do so many things. And look, God's, God's gifted some of you for some awesome things. Don't waste it on the world. Let God use it for the glory of his kingdom. Don't neglect the gift you have which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid hands on you. Practice these things. Devote yourself to them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this for by doing so you'll save both yourself and your hearers. That's what Paul told Timothy, and, and we, um, let me, let me kind of go at it from this angle. We as a church, and Josh mentioned it earlier, we as a church have a calling to youth ministry. This church was started in February of 2004, and from the very beginning, we had a very, 
very clear calling really to ministries that dealt with preschool and with children and with youth ministry and college ministry. We, we, said, we said from the very beginning, if we had to sacrifice things, if, we had to, if, if adults had to meet in classrooms that weren't painted, and, and, if, and if adults had to give up meeting space, and if adults even had to sacrifice times where we would be in the Word so that we can go and lead youth, uh, you know, that, we would, that we would do that, that we would, we would, in our hearts, we would invest in preschool and children's ministry and youth ministry and college ministry. And... And the reason is, and that's why I entitled the message today, is because our students are important. Guys, you are important, and I want you to know that. But here's the, here's the problem. We have a dilemma on our hands, I believe. I believe in my heart. We have a dilemma on our hands in the church, not necessarily Cross Haven Church, but in the church in the United States of America. We have a dilemma in the homes of so-called Christian parents and families where kids, where kids are not seeing biblical Christianity as it is supposed to be. Our, our kids, because I think of what we have done, are heading on a crash course toward disaster apart from the direction of Christ. And that responsibility is on our hands, parents. It is. And look, I, I may be preaching to the choir a little bit. There's a lot of awesome parents in this room. And you're the ones that showed up on Memorial Day weekend. So I may be preaching to the choir. Maybe we should just take notes and go tell all the other ones that didn't, didn't come today. Our kids are not seeing biblical Christianity for what it is. And I'm thankful for Cross Haven. I'm thankful that we... Look, I'm, Josh, I'm thankful... I'm thankful for what, for what you do. I'm thankful for all the people you talked about that plug in and who serve and who give time. I've, I've watched it. I mean, I, I saw this has nothing to do with youth ministry. It has really to do with our children's ministry. But I watched about 20 folks from our church yesterday just go out and canvas the community just to tell people about summer, our summer experience here at Cross Haven. I think that is so cool. And people give and give and give, and I'm so thankful for that. But the, but the dilemma of teaching kids the truth and letting them see what it means to live, a, live with a Christian worldview and to see that living for Christ is the most important thing in their lives, I think that's what's, what's missing. There's a, there's a book, it's called Unchristian. It's written by David Kinneman. David Kinneman works for the Barna Group, and uh, he's a believer, and he wrote this book, and it, it's amazing to me that I've never read a book like this. Here's the first sentence in the book, it says Christianity has an image problem, and I think he's probably I think he's probably right because what people and what our younger culture is growing up seeing is not biblical Christianity. They're not seeing people devoted their lives being poured out to Christ. They're seeing church, they're seeing entertainment, they're seeing um, they're seeing all these things that we're portraying in American Christianity, but they're not seeing Jesus Christ high and lifted up. And I was, I was reading this book, and it's amazing. And the, you're not going to get better statistics than the Barna Research Group. And if you look at what are called, again, the, the uh, born-again baby busters, that's Christians who are in the baby buster generation. That's from, and that's not even youth. That's ages 23 to 41. I'm, I'm, on, I'm, I'm heading up that group. I'll be 41 in September. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like leading that group, you know, the baby busters. But if you compare that to the older generation, all you old folks who are 42 and older, um, if, you, if you look at that group, it's amazing the changes in percentages of the, of the way that we see morality. This is, this is amazing to me. In that group that's 42 years and older, and these are people who say they are born again, they are churchgoers, they are Christians, 33% of the 42 and older crowd think that cohabitation is okay. That living together before you're married is okay. 59% of those who are 23 to 41 say it's okay. These are born-again people who say they are believers in Christ. Sex outside of marriage, 23% for the older generation, 44% for the younger. Pornography, 19%. It's okay, 42 and older. 33%. It's okay, but get this. This is amazing. Abortion. 27%, okay with it. Murder a child, yeah, that's cool. 
32% of the younger generation. It's okay to have an abortion. This got me, though. 6% of the older generation, 42 and older, say that it's, that it's 6% say that they are, you know, <laughs> that, that they're, that I, I can't believe this, allowing the F word on broadcast television, 6% believe that it's morally acceptable. 7% of the younger generation think it's morally acceptable. So there's a bigger stand on whether or not the F word is said on broadcast television than there, there is on abortion or sex outside of marriage or gambling. We've got a warped view of morality is what I'm saying. It, it's, it's crazy. One sentence in here says that we're facing significant difficulties with character and moral compromises even within the church. And here's the problem. I believe the moral dilemma is a result of a spiritual dilemma. If you want to write down one thing today, that's it right there. Hashtag that, okay? A moral dilemma is a result of a spiritual dilemma. Let's, look, we love our youth here. Our students are important, so let's give them what's most important spiritually. Students, I, I, I deeply desire, I want for you to see that Christianity is not about a moral list of do's and don'ts. It is about a relationship with Jesus Christ that saves your life and changes who you are and shapes you for eternity. And that relationship changes your do's and don'ts when you know Christ and know Him well. So how do we do this? I, I'm just like Josh. I, I love teenagers. I used to be one too. I, I really did. One, one of, I mean, I had some boneheaded teenage moves. I was, I was a goofball, a moron of a teenager. I, I was an idiot. I, you know, and, and my kids, are, are, my two oldest are about to be teenagers, so they can't listen when I'm saying this stuff because they can't do what I did. But I can remember the dumb stuff. I can, I can remember it like it was yesterday, my senior year of, of high school. And I was a good kid. I was, but I was just a bonehead. I was just, I was an idiot. And, and so I can remember it. And, I, and it, me and my buddies, we had this bright idea that we would, we would skip school. We would skip, and uh, we, we, did, we were not going to eat in the cafeteria that day. We were going to Dairy Queen. I mean, we were going to DQ. And so we had this bright, and those of you that, that might have gone to Coleman High School, that's where I graduated from, the old A and B and C building down there. Well, I was going to be the driver, and so I go and get my car, and I circle the building, and I picked up, we were like clowns in one of those cars. There was like 15 of us in my little Honda Accord, and we, we all pile in, the, we pile in the Accord, and we go to Dairy Queen, and we eat, and man, we're coming back, and we're like, man, that, we're going to do this every day. They, they don't ever know. And we drive up, and we pull up to the red light, and guess who pulls up beside us? Our assistant principal. <laughs> pulls up beside me, he waves at me, and he points toward the school. I thought, we got caught. And so we, we turn off, and I thought, well, you know, we're seniors. He probably doesn't care. He'll be okay with it. He'll, he'll let it go. So I go and drop off my buddies. I let them back out at B building. I circle back around and pull into the parking lot, and me and my smart self as a teenager, I'm walking through the parking lot holding my Dairy Queen cup. <laughs> and our principal, not the assistant that caught us, pops out from behind the dumpster and he says, Hey, Mr. Murphy, where you been? I said, I just went out to my car and I had to get something. And I said, I noticed this Dairy Queen cup in the parking lot and I was trying to be a good citizen. Thought I'd pick it up and throw it in the dumpster. <laughs> he said, Well, let me see that cup there, Mr. Murphy. I hand him the cup, and uh, he said, how long has that cup been out here, you think? I said, I don't know. I said, somebody probably dropped it this morning. He said, well, that's some pretty good ice if it doesn't melt like that. You know, and so my cup had ice in it. He said, I think you've been to Dairy Queen. And I said, well, you got me. And stuff like that seemed to happen to me all the time. That was just about as bad as we faked a guy dying with a, with a uh, Pepsi machine falling on top of him. But <laughs> anyway, but, you know, we just did dumb stuff like that. And, uh, and like I said, I'm about to have two teenagers in my house. Anybody looking to adopt? Uh, I'm, just kidding, I'm just kidding. We'll let them go for a couple of years. I'm just, um, I, seriously, I was in youth and college ministry for nine years, um, a lot like Josh. I love youth. I, I always want to be that pastor that loves youth. I don't want to be that guy that gets old and is out of touch with the younger generation. I don't like that pastor. I never did like that pastor. I don't want to be that guy. Um, 
I even asked Allison if I could have one of those snapback hats that the kids are getting for the kids' worship team and the, with the flat bill for, I don't know how to wear that. But I told her I better not go with the tank top, though. That would be embarrassing for the whole church. But um, Someone has said that raising teenagers is like trying to nail jello to a tree. And I agree. I mean, teenagers are always changing. Nothing's constant always bouncing around, but man, I love him. I mean, Forrest, Forrest Gump probably had it right, and he wasn't even, te- he wasn't even talking about um, teenagers when he said, you know, life's like a box of chocolates, you never know what you're going to get. I mean, that's what it, it, really, it, it really is. And we can learn a lot. We can learn a lot from teenagers. We really can, uh, especially about how uncool we are when we, uh, when we learn from teenagers, um, how out of style we are, how much we, we don't know. I read this about teenagers, um, with teenagers on time as a relative term, for example, on time for school is important to you as a parent, but not so much for the teenager. However, being on time to pick up your teen is vitally important at all times. Um, Fashion is not in the eye of the beholder. Fashion is in the eye of the teenager, right? A parent can walk straight off the runway in Milan and still be uncool. Whatever the teenager's wearing at the moment, that is cool. No matter how well you did on your ACTs or how well you did in college or even how much you have succeeded in life, you will never be as smart as your teenager because they know everything, right? (laughs) Texting, (laughs) some kid just now said amen. (laughs) Texting is a vital means of communication for teenagers, right? Unless your mother is texting you. That's never cool. Unless you're asking her about food and then that's semi-cool. Yet it's still not real very, it's still not very cool. And then speaking of cool, adults... We are not cool. If you're a parent, give it up. You can try. You could be the coolest person among every adult you know, but you're not with your teen. You're never cool unless they need money, and then it's like, Daddy, you're so cool. You're the coolest daddy in the world. Can I have $20? See, the beauty of all this, though, is that they outgrow it. And one day a miracle happens, and parents suddenly become cool and smart. All of a sudden, I'm still waiting for that to happen, but I know that it will. I can remember when all of a sudden my parents became very cool and very smart and much more brilliant as I became older. And Timothy, like I said, was about 30 years old, and Paul was giving him advice in a culture where he had the responsibility of leading. And Paul says, Timothy, don't demand respect. He said, let no one despise your youth, In fact, make it so that they can't despise your youth by setting them an example. Like I said earlier, I believe that young people can be just as much of an example to older people as older people can be an example to younger people, and they often are. That word example in the Bible right there, in that verse, in verse 12, it comes from a Greek word. The Greek word is called tupos, and it means to make a pattern for others to follow. To make a pattern for others to follow. Paul was saying to Timothy, make a pattern. and Look at the things that he talked about. He said, make a pattern in your speech. Make a pattern in your conduct. Make a pattern in your love. Make a pattern in your faith. Make a pattern in your purity. So that when others look at you, when an older generation looks at you, they can't do anything but respect you. So that you win the respect of other people people. And let me just say to the church, our students are important and we need to set them in a place where they can be successful and can do this. Our homes and our church need to be a place where teenagers can learn to be what Paul is telling Timothy to be right here. Because teenagers, let me be honest with you, that's what God expects. It doesn't matter what I expect or what Josh expects or really what your... I mean, those things are important. What your parents expect, those are important. But what really matters is what God expects. I hope we see that. How can we help our teenagers be in a place where they can do this? I mean, first of all, it starts at home. That means parents need to take responsibility. That means having your students involved in the things that are most important in life and the things of God are much more important than all the other things you can have them involved in. And that doesn't mean don't have them involved in the other things, but that means set a very clear precedent on the things that are most important. Let them see that the other things that they do are catalysts by which they can use their faith that God has given them. You see, leading them at home is more important than anything else. 
Paul is telling Timothy, set an example in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. And that's totally different. That gets, that's countercultural. That's totally different than what our culture teaches. I mean, teenagers, here's what happens. Everyone around you may be living one way, and you've seen it. You know, I'm not telling you anything new. You, pe- you see people living life the way that God never designed it to be. And, and, and Paul's telling Timothy, do the total opposite. Paul's telling Timothy, he's saying, don't be that guy that says, oh, I'm going to say I'm a Christian, but then I'm going to have a foul potty mouth, toilet mouth, and talk ignorant and can't say a sentence without five cuss words in it. He says, set an example in your speech. Paul's saying the total opposite of I'm a Christian on Sunday, but oh, well, I think I'll just get drunk, sleep around, become something totally different than I say that I am on Sunday and be something totally different the rest of the week and come back Sunday and play the part again. Paul's telling Timothy, you can't, you can't do that. You'll never be the real deal. Paul's saying, you set the example. You be the real deal. Paul's saying, it's not a game. Paul's saying, God has a better way for you than garbage living. That's the best way I know how to put it. Make sure your speech, your conduct, your love, your faith, and your purity are good. That's what he told Timothy. And here's what we see. We don't have a whole lot of time, but here's, here's what we see. Paul's words to Timothy. Here's three things that really come out in this context. You can write these down. One, Paul's telling Timothy, let no one despise you for your youth. So that obviously says to me that youth can be despised. Paul's saying don't let anybody do it. So obviously it can be. Youth are often looked down upon because of the attitudes and the behavior that that some people think may be annoying or immature. But I just want to say, youth, we love you. I love it that you're quirky and different. You keep us on our toes. Listen, I, I've listened to, I, I've, I've, I've seen it, been there and done that. And you don't have to do the things that are cultural to be cool. You don't have to, you don't have to try to fit six or, six or seven cuss words in a sentence just to see if you can do it. I mean, you don't, you don't have to do that. Paul says, let no one despise your youth. Give, them, give people a reason not to. Secondly, youth or students should not be indifferent to what adults think. What adults think should be important to you. It it really should be. The way adults view you should be important to you. It should cause you to to want to to do what God wants you to do. And I'm I'm just telling you that, So as as Paul said, set an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. You have to realize... That, that if there are adults around you who are investing in your life, like in our student ministry, and they're saying that, that obviously God's put that on their hearts, and it means something. So follow after that. And the third thing is this, and I mentioned it earlier, and this is the key to it all. Ultimately, you should look to God's standards. At the end of the day, you have to look at what God expects, because the bottom line is this, not all adults are going to set you a good example. You've got a bunch here at this church. You've got a bunch of great parents got a bunch of great people here at this church, and they're setting you some awesome examples, but not every adult's going to set you a great example. In fact, we'll all fail. There's, there's hypocrisy everywhere. I'm going to try my best as a dad and as a pastor and as a friend, but ultimately I'm not perfect. Josh is not perfect. None of us are perfect. But Paul says, I want you to look to Christ and to, and to Christ's standards. Let no one despise you for youth, but set the believers an example in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Find out what God wants and and begin to do that. And he gives these examples. So Paul's main point in this this morning, church, is that that Timothy should not have low expectations of the impact of his life. I want to say to our teenagers this morning, don't have low expectations as to the impact of your life. This room is full of, and we got a lot of teenagers that weren't here this morning. I know it's Memorial Day weekend, but this church is full of teenagers who don't realize the impact that they're going to have. They don't realize the impact that they're going to have. And it can be good or it can be bad. This church is full of some difference makers who are going to make a big difference for the kingdom of God. But if you waste it away, you can make a big difference the other way. I'm just going to challenge you. Great students with great potential. We as a church have to invest in that. Don't adopt low expectations. And church, let's don't adopt low expectations. Our students are important. We got to think that way. We got to dream that way. And I hope that's the heart call of our church. That's all I got this morning. Let's pray together. And uh, Josh, you want to invite our students up as we close out?
this morning. Let's do that this morning. Uh, Aaron's going to come and lead us. We're going to sing together as a church. But as we do that, I want to invite you for an invitation like we always do. Hey, there's Harris right there. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> that was kind of odd. I looked down, there was Harris. Um, as we do every week, I want to invite you. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, we are here, and we want to share with you how you can be saved. But let's do something else special in this. I want to invite our students, first of all, our graduates, um, but also the rest of our students. We just want to pray over you this morning. If y'all want to come down to the altar, I just want to ask the church kind of to fill in behind them. And let's pray over our students this morning. Today's been about them, and we want to invest in them, okay? So let's sing, let's worship. If you need to come and pray, come and do that, okay?